Before we start the show, I want to tell you about Serve HQ. Every church leader knows that having trained and engaged volunteers is essential to successfully accomplishing your mission. But if you're like most leaders, you know how tricky it is to get people onboarded and equip the people on your team. They're busy. They're all over the place. They can't come to the meeting. And at church on Sundays, as often, it's too busy to do it. But what if there was a resource that made it easier? Let me recommend to you ServeHQ. ServeHQ is simple video training courses that help you equip volunteers and develop leaders. You can create your own training or you can use their video library. You can even automate next steps to onboard new people. Simply, easily, efficiently build up your leaders. Check it out at servehq.church and the link is in the show notes. That's ServeHQ. Dot church where people are exchanging words like nasty words to each other online we can step in as followers of jesus and say hey instead of extending just more words more vitriol to this online conversation or interaction i want to i want to offer my presence you know can we meet for a cup of coffee if uh, the person's you know geographically nearby um can we engage on a more personal level instead of having this long, crazy, drawn out public discourse where we're just bashing each other? Can we talk, you know, can we FaceTime and just have an actual cordial conversation? So, you know, I think followers of Jesus have an opportunity um, uh, to, to show a, a better way forward, you know, and, and a part of that is in a world of utter critique um, to seek to commune with one another. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm your host, Joanna LaFleur. This is season nine, episode six. Today on the podcast, we have Pastor Jay Kim. He's from Silicon Valley and the author of books called Analog Church and a newer book called Analog Christian. So can't wait to dive into this conversation. Thank you so much to our sponsors who are making this possible. Serve HQ. You can train your ministry volunteers, your leaders, and new members online fast and easy with Serve HQ. Compassion Canada, who is lifting children from poverty in Jesus' name. And Scripture Untangled, a new podcast by the Canadian Bible Society. Hey, if you haven't yet joined us on YouTube, hit subscribe on YouTube. Follow us there for tutorials and a back catalog of podcasts. And we continue the conversation through the week on our digital church Facebook group. We'd love to catch you there. It's how we can stay connected. It's how you might find a new job. It's how you can ask a question. It's how you can interact with other people who are like you. And we want to train you up with free resources. We want you to share these videos with people on your team. If these podcasts help you, if you connect with it, pass it along to someone who knows. The only way that other people can find this podcast is if people tell them about it. Your recommendation means the world. So let me tell you about Jay Kim before we dive into the conversation. He's a follower of Jesus in Silicon Valley in California, and he leads the church called Westgate Church. So although he's in Silicon Valley, that's like the heart of tech industry. He is also the author of both Analog Church and now Analog Christian. His writing and his ideas are featured in places like Christianity Today, The Gospel Coalition, Miss You Alliance, Outreach, and Relevant Magazine. So his thinking around how digital and church and how digital and our faith affect us, connect us, disconnect us. You're going to love his thinking, getting inside his brain in this conversation. Enjoy the conversation with Jay Kim. Jay Kim, welcome to Word Made Digital. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm happy to be on. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you. I discovered you on the internet, which is where I discover so many things these days. And um, <laughs> um, I, as soon as I saw what you um, have spent a lot of work and writing uh, and time developing, I said, I got to get this guy on my podcast. <laughs> so before we go any further, maybe just let, what, let's introduce you. Who, who is J. Kim? <laughs> uh, yeah, the answer to that question's not that exciting. <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just a guy. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus in the Silicon Valley of California. I've been here basically my entire life. Um, I'm a husband and a dad. Uh, Jenny and I have been married 
14 years. We've got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old that keep us quite busy. Um, and I am a, I'm a local church pastor, so I serve as the lead pastor at a uh, church here in um, the Silicon Valley called Westgate Church. And, uh, and I write a little bit, you know, and speak a little bit um, when I get the, the privilege and the honor to do so. So yeah, like you said, I, um, in the last couple of years, I've written uh, a couple of books um, that sort of are, are companion books called uh, Analog Church and Analog Christian, which, you know, like you, we kind of live in the same world. I've spent a lot of time thinking about the digital age and uh, the beauty of it and the benefits, as well as, you know, potential drawbacks and how it might be forming us. And um, it's just an area of high interest for me for uh, for a number of reasons. So there you go. That's uh, that's the short of it. And this is is maybe not the, the focus of the conversation, but the, one of the things that people think about a lot when they think about Silicon Valley, San Francisco in the last couple of years, especially is this is a, and I'm curious about this in relation to Christians, ministry, et cetera, incredibly expensive, restrictively yeah. expensive place to live. Um, yes. and, and then therefore like, you know, I can't imagine people in ministry, especially if they're in more junior roles, they're, they're not getting paid very well. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I was just seeing an article that said a local school board in the San Francisco area, the Silicon Valley area, was asking families to consider hosting a teacher in their home because these teachers right. can't afford yeah. to live where they teach. Um, yeah. Talk to us about that because I think it's related to digital where it's related to this. We can work anywhere. We have this huge wealth yeah. development in this intense, you know, small area. You know, it affects every other part of life. Physical affects yeah. dig digital affects analog. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I um that's uh the Milpitas School District, which is about uh 15, 20 minutes north of where I am. Um, yeah, they just recently asked families if they have spare rooms or, you know, in-law units to open them up at low cost for teachers because the district is having such a difficult time, uh, retaining and then even hiring new teachers because it is so expensive to live here. What's surprising about that is Milpitas, again, which is about 15, 20 minutes north of where I am here, um, it's, it's the cost of living there is actually uh, a decent amount lower than it is even right here. Huh. And then you go um, north in the other direction, sort of there's the East Bay and and then the San Francisco Bay. You go west up the San Francisco Bay and every 10 miles or so that you go north from here, it just gets progressively more and more expensive until you get to San Francisco where it's almost impossible to live, as well as kind of right here um, in the heart of Silicon Valley. I think there was a, a recent article that said um, six out of the 10 most expensive places to live in uh, in the country are here in the Bay Area. Six of so, 10. Wow. Yeah. In terms of cities. Yeah. So um, yeah, you're right. You know, uh, serving and leading in the local church here in the Bay Area, here in the Silicon Valley is um, it's immensely challenging. It's uniquely challenging. Uh, so at the same time, um, what it also means is that for the majority of people who do live here, um, they make a, a, a certain income. <laughs> Otherwise you couldn't live here. You right. know? So as a, as a pastor and as a church leader, someone who deeply loves the local church, I think a part of the, the challenge and opportunity before us is um, cultivating a, a generosity culture. And, and I will say uh, that that part of it doesn't get written about enough. I think on a national level, um, followers of Jesus here in the Bay area are, really generous, you know, not everybody. Um, and certainly there's more to be done, but, uh, but there is a spirit of generosity here. People are not uh, unaware of how challenging it is, you know? So for us, just to be very frank, for us here at our church, um, last year, our elders initiated uh, a fairly significant, the most significant cost of living adjustment for our staff in our church's history. And it wasn't, um, it was out of necessity because right. with inflation and the already sort of prohibitive cost of living here, yeah, we just had many staff, especially gifted, talented, younger staff 
who were at a breaking point where it just, they were going to have to move, you know, out of the area. So, um, and, and there's other churches who are doing the same. So yeah, it is challenging, but I, you know, it's for me personally, it's home. I've been here for, you know, basically almost 40 years, you know, which is almost my entire life. So, um, I can't imagine being elsewhere. Uh, well, that's not true. I, I can't imagine myself being on the beaches of San Diego. You know, in <laughs> that sounds but, good too. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's also expensive down there as well. So, <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And so then in relation to, um, you know, this, the reason we're on the podcast today, we want to talk about digital, how it's shaping our world, how it's discipling us. Um, yeah. how did you, how did this become an interest for you? Is it just like, well, you live in the place where, you know, Facebook and Google and Apple are, uh, so it was like, everybody talks about this or what, what kind of drew you into thinking about this and, and thinking about this maybe pastorally? Yeah. Well, there were a couple of things. One, I had two specific instances. One was just my own recognition um, that I had a digital addiction. I just years ago, several years ago, I found myself sort of unable to untether myself from my smartphone. Mm-hmm. Um, I found myself sort of incessantly, habitually, uh, needlessly checking email constantly and scrolling social media at any moment of boredom. Um, and, and, you know, we'll talk more about this, but I'm not anti-digital. Uh, you know, that's sort of a misunderstanding people have about me based on my work, um, or at least maybe a, a, a not thorough reading of my work. I'm not anti-digital at all. Uh, and that, that's not, I'm not really commenting that much on digital um, technology in and of itself. I think it has more to do with us, you know, and me. And so that's, that's really, that was kind of the initial genesis of, of some of my thinking along these lines. I just, I became sort of fascinated by my own addiction. How did I get here? What is it doing to me? Um, how do I free myself? How do I experience liberation from, uh, from my digital addictions? And then there was another moment, um, when our church, the church where I'm on staff, when, uh, we went from years ago, we went from, a single location to a multi-site model. And so we are still currently a multi-campus. Um, we, we try to use the language multi-congregational church. So we have folks who gather in different parts of our city. And when we initially went to that model, we um, we did what most multi-sites do. We had a, a video teaching model. So I would get up and get ready to preach. Um, back then we had Saturday night services as well. So I remember one, one Saturday getting up to preach the sermon and the, the person who was sort of organizing and running the service, she leans over right before I get up and she says, Jay, remember we're multi-site now. So when you preach, um, when you teach, look at that camera in the back of the room. And then she said these words that because the camera is the people, you know, the camera is Mm. the people. And, And I know what she meant and she was just doing her job and it was, you know, wonderful, but I just remember that really throwing me off because I, I remember thinking to myself, but it's not, that's just a camera. <laughs> They're not actually people. And I know what she meant, but it was interesting too, because at the time, again, we had Saturday evening services. So the camera was recording me. And as I was looking at the camera, it's not like there were even people in some other part of town that were actually watching currently. It was being recorded for people to watch like the next day right. at these other campuses. And I just remember that being such a jarring experience. So I started Fra- asking fractured or something for you. Yeah. It's fractured yeah. experience. Yeah. It's not a person and yeah. they're not even anyone live on the other end is what you're saying. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So I just, it just, you know, I just started thinking about it quite a bit and then started doing a lot of reading and having conversations and one thing led to the next and two books later, here here we are. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I love that you're, you're saying... Uh, You know, I grew up in an area, not grew up, I went to university in an area that was both two things. One, they called it Silicon Valley North, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, which is where companies like BlackBerry came from, which Mm. BlackBerry, like nobody has them anymore. But at the time, they were a big deal. (laughs) Yes, I had one. (laughs) Well, yeah, many many of us did. And uh, anyway, so so it was like it's like like the number one recruiting place for a lot of Silicon Valley companies is this university in the town that I went to and where I went to school. And um, 
And so, but at the same time, in this exact same area of Canada, there's all these Amish people or Mennonite people mm. who are like horse and mm. buggy. And it's this interesting yeah. contrast between the two. Um, and it was sort of a very religious region of mm. Canada. Um, but yep. I appreciate what you're saying this, the point of me just saying this, there is a difference. What you're, you're saying is not anti-technology. Um, you're right. not move, you're not suggesting sort of a radical, um, evacuation from technology. Um, no. so, I mean, in some ways I think of like addiction, like if you have a narcotic addiction an alcohol addiction, the answer is don't, t don't touch it. Don't go anywhere near it. But when you have right. something like a food addiction, uh, you still have to eat. <laughs> so you have yeah. to figure out like a better relationship to food. Um, yeah, that's right. And so in, in the same way with digital, you're not saying cut it out completely. Uh, become an Amish Mennonite approach, um, but saying right. like, what is our healthier relationship to it? Um, and and I, I guess I'm I'm trying to come around to this idea of like, what are some of the markers of that? You know, even when you think of like when people say they're addicted to their phone, do you have any sense of like what does that even mean for someone that they've gone too far in that direction? Yeah, you know, I think I mean there's a lot to say there. I think one of the best ways to determine your level anybody's level of addiction um is to cut it out for a little while and uh you know, pay attention to the withdrawal symptoms. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I try to practice in my own life and I recommend to people is the the regular habitual practice of digital sabbath. You know, we take Sabbaths um, as followers of Jesus. We take Sabbaths in general, right? It's commanded, and um, there's there's a lot to that. Uh, the 20th century Jewish rabbi um, Heschel, Abraham Joshua Heschel, you know, he's got that fantastic book called The Sabbath, and in it he makes this beautiful distinction. He essentially says, you know, humans live on two planes of reality. Um, you know, in the world of time and the, in the world of space. So the world of space being stuff. And he talks about how Sabbath is, um, you know, I'm paraphrasing him here, but it basically re it restores you into the story of time. And it's really interesting. Um, I think that s Sabbaths are important in the sense that they don't just give us rest. They help us to order our lives appropriately. And that's a part of what Heschel was saying is sometimes we forget that no matter how much stuff we think we can accumulate, what no human on the earth can have more of than the other is time. Like everybody mm -hmm. is allotted the same amount of time, 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute you know, 31 days in a month, whatever it might be, right? We all have the same amount of time. And Sabbath is a way of reminding ourselves, like, no matter how much stuff we have, no matter how much we fill the spaces we inhabit, the reality is time marches on and tomorrow will be here in the same amount of time as it will be for everybody else. And so Digital Sabbaths are a way of resetting and restoring ourselves, you know, into a, into a more, uh, into a more profound and beautiful story. Asking the question, am I actually spending the time that I have been given as a gift by God in a way that leads me down the path of flourishing and fulfillment and joy and peace and all of those things that, that I truly want? And I think one of the best ways to ask ourselves that question is to take a Sabbath, you know, and to just take a deep breath from uh, the everyday sort of mundane, ordinary habits and rhythms of our lives and consider how does my, even like my body, how does my body react when I shut it all down? So in my own life, uh, what that looks like is one day a week. So on Saturdays, my family practices a digital Sabbath. We detach from all things digital. I don't check email. Um, I only use my phone if we're using Google Maps to get directions to a place we're driving to. Um, Jenny and I try to take our kids on a hike every Saturday. We almost always have uh, so, so some sort of play date with friends at a park, um, try to share a good meal. So I think digital Sabbaths are one of the ways that we can, on a consistent basis, 
um, deeply and soberingly consider, like you said so well, you know, our relationship with technology right. and is that relationship healthy? Is it, is, is the relationship based on, um, parameters which allow us to use technology appropriately rather than the technology using us. And I think that's one of the most important things about one of the most important things to consider when we think about digital technology is that it, because of its inherent design, typically, if we are not intentional about how we are using the technology, um, then the technology will use us, you know, it'll use us in a number of ways and in ways that we might not even be aware. I hope you're enjoying the conversation with Jay Kim. I know that the Bible itself beyond the digital world, it can feel so overwhelming and confusing and even hard to believe with so many other options out there today. It can be confusing, but Scripture Untangled is a new podcast by the Canadian Bible Society. And they're bringing you interviews with culture leaders, leaders in ministry, and Bible thinkers to help you be inspired to dive into the Bible and understand it. Listen for free and subscribe to Scripture Untangled on your preferred podcast app. The link will be down in the show notes. We'd love for you to check out the new podcast. And do you think that's always been the case? Um, this idea of, because I think we felt a lot more optimistic a decade ago about technology yeah. or about these specific digital technologies. Uh, and it's yeah. kind of like we've become a bit more sober about it. Do you think... Um, do you think that's true for you too? Like this idea of the device is using you as much yeah. more than we are using it. I'd love you to kind of dig into that a little more. Like how does that play out? Or what have we discovered yeah. even in like the the exposés and the news in the last little while of like what is going on with these devices? Right. Yeah. No, I th I do think this is a unique, this is a unique reality, the one we're facing now. Um, there's a sort of pervasiveness with digital technology that has not been true of any technology before, like literally in human history. Digital technology is pervasive and ubiquitous in a way that no other technology, not the television, not the telephone, not books and the printing press, like literally no communication technology has ever been as pervasive. Mm. And, and, that's not conjecture and it's not hyperbole. It's just literally math. So, um, you think about, you know, I think some of the data shows us that the average smartphone user spends three hours a day on their phone. Um, Apple released, uh, some data a couple of years ago that the average iPhone user unlocks their phone 150 times a day. Um, you know, social wow. media users, yeah. they think over the course of a lifetime, like an 80 year lifespan, if you do the math, um, social media users, if you multiply it by like an 80 year average lifespan, they will spend the average social media user will spend five entire years of their life scrolling social media. So you can go back to all of these giant leaps forward in communication technology, whether it's the, you know, again, the, television or um, telephone uh, or, you know, the printing press, uh, whatever it might be, none of it has been this ubiquitous um, and this pervasive. Because of that, I think uh, there is a sort of formative power to digital technology that's really unique. And like you said, some of the more recent whistleblowers, you know, Francis Haugen with Facebook, um, Tristan Harris is a name that many people know because of his work on uh, the social dilemma documentary that was on Netflix. Um, you know, what, what we are finding is that, um, the way the sort of algorithms are mapped out, they're intended to pad the bottom line of particularly social media companies. And again, this is not some sort of blanket critique of social media companies. I'm just saying, the way they are designed, unless we are intentional, unless we um, use caution and care in terms of our engagement, they are inherently designed to uh, grab our attention and to keep that attention, you know, for an extended period of time. And, uh, and it's working, 
you know what the data is bearing out is that it is working, that we are, for the most part, we're hooked. You know, 84% of Americans say they admit that they could not go one full day without their smartphone. You know, 84% right. say I can't go a day without it. So um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to be said there. But again, this is not a critique of the tool. This is about us. Like there is a way in which we can, as you said, again, you know, sort of reimagine our relationship with the technology in such a way that uh, it's a healthy relationship and a relationship in which we can leverage the benefits of the technology um, to bring about good in the world and to draw us closer to God and to one another. Uh, but unless we are intentional, the technologies will take over and uh, dictate the terms of, of our life. Right. Well, and, and in these two books that you've written that are sort of um, sister books, Analog Church uh, in 2020, I mean, I mean, maybe just as a pause, did, did you know, I imagine in the printing cycle, did you know pandemic was happening? You know, you're, you're releasing a book about Analog Church in an era where like all the churches went online 2020. Yeah. Um, but then you got Analog <laughs> Christian in 2022. Um, um, you're talking about the, the tagline for Analog Christian, cultivating contentment, resilience, and wisdom. Um, in what ways, I guess, that we could say, if this is what's happening with the technology, it's forming us, or what we would say as Christians is discipling us. It's, it's, it's yeah. instead of Christian formation, formation after Christ, it's forming us after a different set of values. Um, can you talk to that? Like, what are some of those? They're not necessarily all bad values, but in what ways are, if you can give us sort of like a this versus that, or like what are some of those contradictions that maybe Christians aren't realizing um, are shaping them that are not really traditionally Christian values or Christian formation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, high level sort of big picture overview, a lot has been written about this already, but, um, you know, Pew Research Center just came out with a recent study about teens and social media. Um, the social scientist, Jonathan Haidt, he's written significantly about sort of, you can, you can, graph you can you can chart on a graph when um the smartphone was introduced and there's almost like a lit literally like a, a parallel uh line on that same graph as smartphone sales increased you know levels of depression feelings of loneliness and isolation particularly amongst emerging generations particularly amongst younger girls the lines look the same, you know? And wow. uh, so there's been a lot said about this. Um, and again, it's, it, I'm not blaming the technology. I'm blaming human lack of deep, thoughtful consideration about engagement with the technology. And so I think, again, lots been written about this. I cite some of the work in my book, but basically I think social media in particular, but also just, um, you know, uh, digital engagement with news media and whatever else, uh, what it's done is it, 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 it sort of put us on a treadmill. There's this um, phrase that was coined by a British psychologist named Michael Asink in the 1990s, a phrase called the hedonic treadmill, you know, hedonic meaning he hedonism, the sort of uh, pursuit of pleasure and then treadmill, meaning you're like running and chasing, but you never get anywhere. And he proposed that, you know, we are living in the Western world. We are living on a hedonic treadmill, constantly chasing pleasure, but never arriving. And I think social media in particular has accelerated that trend. You know, we sort of scroll and swipe our way through comparison, which I think leads to contempt. A lot of times mm -hmm. we sort of compare our real, ordinary, sort of physical, visceral, analog lives to the glossy, very well curated, crafted, filtered digital images of the lives people want to project out there. And intellectually, we know that that's just a curated version of their life. Their life is not as exciting and sexy as it might seem on Instagram. But even though we know that intellectually, something still happens to us emotionally and mentally and psychologically, maybe even spiritually, where we begin really comparing. We're like, man, I, I want to live that life. I, why am I sitting here in the cubicle when my friends, you know, sitting yeah. on my tie on the beaches of the Maldives or something. And um, that was very that, specific, again, Jay. <laughs> that was a very specific right. reference. Is that somebody you just saw on, on Instagram today? 
<laughs> no, I just made that up, but I've done lots of these interviews. So that's the one that comes to mind. So yeah, you know, we, so yeah, we, we, we run on this hedonic treadmill fueled by comparison. It leads to contempt. We start feeling real contempt for others. And then it throws us into this spiral of despair. You know, we're just like, we despair because we feel like our lives aren't cutting it. You know, we're not living the dream like everybody else is. And, and, you know, and we've grown significantly impatient in the digital age because everything is so fast. You think about how news media works in the digital age, these sort of quick hit sound bites and clickbait headlines, you know, designed to just fuel like, like vitriol and anger in, in you. And we've become incredibly hostile and outrage culture, you know, sort of yeah. looms large all around us. So, so there's so much that's been undone in us. Um, that is not the way of Jesus. It's not what discipleship to Jesus looks like. So the answer in my estimation is not to throw away your digital device and to become a Luddite and be Amish and live on a farm and churn your own butter or something. Although if that's God's calling on your life, wonderful. But for most of us, that's not the answer. That would simply be running away from the problem rather than working on the problem and addressing the problem. So I, I think the answer is to lean our lives more into um, the move of the spirit of God in and through us and ask God uh, to free us and liberate us from our digital addictions and help us to leverage digital technologies in a more redemptive way. Right. And so, you know, I think back to the, you know, where you started this story of this idea of a multi-site or multi-congregation church, the camera is the people, the people who aren't yeah. even there right now, they'll be watching this later at some other time. Um, I think that one of the big things that happened during the pandemic is that everybody did this online church thing. Um, everybody, uh, for some places longer, some places shorter, churches that had never tried online church or, you know, distance-based digital content. Every was trial by fire. Everyone was doing it. Um, yeah. But what do you think of that? on this side. So that was sort of like necessity at that time. That was the way to gather. And in Canada, it went on way longer than it did in the U.S. But mm -hmm. what do you think of it on this side? Like, should church continue online? What do you think about in, yeah. in online church? And that probably means five different things. But how do you think about that as a, as a pastor with kind of like, you know, so you, you've done so much work in this area, you know, how do you wrestle with that issue? That's a great question. Yeah. So I'll just talk about our church here. First of all, I don't think it's, you know, monolithic. I, I would, um, I would hesitate to say this is the right way to do it. So if you don't do it this way, you're wrong. Um, I think that pastors are called to congregations and to cities and to towns. And I think, Every church leader, every pastor needs to prayerfully seek God. God, what do you have for us? Why are we here? What's the best way? Uh, what's, what's the most effective way for us to be faithful in terms of who and what you've called us to? So that's the first thing I'll say. Secondly, I'll just talk about our own experience here. So, um, we still, we still stream our services. Uh, and there's a very specific reason why. And we actually had, and continue to have lots of dialogue about that. Like, should we, shouldn't we, you know, and it is ironic, you know, that a guy who wrote analog church is leading a church and his church is still streaming their services. But, but the reason and really the primary and maybe only reason we're streaming our service is because what we have discovered, what some of the data bears out is that in our day and age, um, I think Ed Stetzer was the first person who said this, um, I think it was him uh, that I heard this from, but basically he said, uh, online is the new lobby. And what he meant by that was nobody, almost no one shows up to a physical church gathering, um, without having watched some form of the online service and typically multiple times. And what we've discovered as a church every single Sunday, like literally without fail, every Sunday, I meet people. Uh, who are brand new to our church. And I think it's safe to say 98% of the time, it might be 100% because I can't recall anybody that I've met in the last year and a half to two years for whom this hasn't been true. 
But basically every new person I meet, and I meet new people every single Sunday, what they tell me is at some point in the conversation, yeah, we watched online for a Uh. couple of weeks or a couple of months, and um, we decided we were ready to come check it out. So for us, that felt like, okay, that for that reason alone, because it is our desire to serve and care for and invite as many in our city um, to the life of following Jesus as possible. So, so for that reason, we keep our online services going. We do not call it online church. Um, our ecclesiology is such that we believe the church is not a service or a gathering or Certainly, it's not Christian content, although all of those things are critically important. I'm not, you know, knocking them or mm-hmm. criticizing them. They're of incredible importance. Um, but I just, by definition, the church is a people. It's a, it's a, it's the people of God who are called out to live the way of Jesus and proclaim the story of God in a real way. So we don't call it online church because we think that church is a people. It's not a service you watch. So we just say like, yeah, you can watch our service online. That's what it says on our website. It says like, you know, watch a service. It says join us in person or watch a service. So you can watch and we're happy to have people watch because we know that that helps folks get a little more acclimated and comfortable. And then we are really clear in, um, in our sort of streaming when we stream our services, you know, we have a host or whatever. And, and almost every Sunday, what they say is, Hey, we're so glad you're joining us online and watching the service. Um, if you're in the Bay area or the Silicon Valley, if, and when you're ready, we would love to meet you. Please join us for a service and say hello. And We'd love to help you get connected, you know? So um, that's been our approach. I think that will probably be our approach for the foreseeable future. So uh, it's, it's, you know, we're not doing it perfectly by any means, but that is sort of our means, our attempt at um, balancing and appropriately leveraging digital technology um, to help people find Jesus and, and follow Jesus. Yeah. Can you, uh, uh, I love, I love this thinking. I don't hear a lot of people describing it this way, Jay. Um, and you talk too about this idea of embodiment, um, mm. which is really kind of the inspiration of this whole thing about word made digital is from John one, as I often say here yeah. on the podcast is, you know, the word became flesh. The word was embodied and dwelt among yeah. us. So what does, what do you think of this idea of embodiment? I mean, this is maybe more the focus of your first book about analog church, this embodying faith that it has to have a physical piece to it, um, which, yeah. which in some ways maybe does make you sound like an old fashioned person <laughs> to a 15 year old who, who would be just their view of digital is quite different than someone who yeah. remembers a world before. Um, yeah. talk to me about Im- this Im- importance of embodiment. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think the COVID pandemic, even for emerging generations, like even for digital natives, you know, kids who were born in into a digital world, you know, in the 2000s. So, you know, Gen Z and younger, Gen Alpha or whatever they're calling these generations now, even for them, I think what the COVID pandemic did, um, despite all of the the pain of it, one of the sort of subtle, strange gifts that it offered us was an incredible, timeless reminder that we are human beings and human experience is an embodied, analog, flesh and blood experience that essentially um, real people need real people and real mm-hmm. places and real things and real experiences. Um, you know, you can virtually eat, but if you only virtually eat, you will die. <laughs> and because a physical body needs physical nourishment. And I think uh, the same is true when it comes to um, the human soul. Uh, the human soul is is designed for community. Um, one of the reasons I believe that amongst many is the fact that I believe hum- I believe in the imago Dei, the image of God. Humans are image bearers of God. And God is communal by his very nature, right? In the beginning, God... Um, says, let us, not let me, let us make humankind in our, in our image. It's because Christians believe in the triune God, you know, one God who exists as three in one, Father, Spirit, Son. Um, the writer Michael Reeves got this fantastic book called Delighting in the Trinity. And I'll paraphrase him here, but basically he says, um, 
God, you know, the reason we read in first John chapter four, that God is love is because God is Trinity. It's because God is relational. So the fact that God is love is not something he has to muster now because he made humans to love. God has been loving since the beginning. In other words, God has lived and existed since the beginning of time, before the beginning of time, within a loving relationship with his triune self, Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Spirit, the Spirit loving the Father, and all the way around. So um, we're made in that image. Humans are made in that image. Well, as Jay and I are talking about how this digital world can change us, transform us, disciple us in a certain way, uh, this word transformation, it can feel a little bit like a buzzword, but what is transformation like in a good way? What does it actually look like? One place I think transformation is so evident is in the stories of former Compassion sponsored children. That's the graduates or the alumni of the Compassion program who are now adults and they're telling their story of how sponsored sponsorship impacted them. Like Eric, who grew up in Compassion's program in Uganda. And Eric entered this program when his father died, the only breadwinner in his family. His widowed mother had nothing left and what little they had got taken away from them by other family members, external family members. They had nothing and they didn't know what to do. And then compassion found them or they found compassion. Eric says, you considered yourself a nobody. You have nothing. And then you receive the news that somebody is coming. This was a life changing story for me altogether. That's what Eric says. And the evidence of this is so clear because Dorothy, Eric's sponsor from North America, they're still in touch today. Eric and Dorothy are still keeping in touch. Child sponsorship transforms lives. And you can find out the full story of how Eric was transformed and learn more about child sponsorship at compassion.ca slash if dash only. Compassion.ca slash if dash only. The link will be down in the show notes. All right, back to the conversation now with Jay. And it, and even just that, as you say, it's as you're describing it, to, it's hard to get our mind around the concept. <laughs> oh, of course, of yeah. course. But you have to ask the question, if you could totally understand it, like if it made complete sense in in the world of sort of like human mathematics, we would then question like, is he really God? Right. <laughs> like yeah. if it all kind of conceptually makes sense to me is, you know, like um, GK Chesterton uh, once wrote that the logician, the person based, you know, basing their life on logic seeks to get his head in the clouds. But um, uh, instead um, it is his head that breaks and it's essentially saying like logic cannot get you there. If you try to fit um, the cosmos and the God of the universe and how he works into your logical mind, your logical mind will break mm -hmm. as it should be. Because if we are the created, he is the creator, it would make little to no sense that we, the created, fully understand and comprehend how the creator has formed and fashioned all of reality. The automobile does not know how its maker made it. You know what I mean? The automobile just simply is functionally the product of some sort of maker. So even for us as animate objects, you know, living creatures, there is a, a gap between creator and creation. So anyways, all of that to say, uh, what COVID did, I think, was bubble up to the surface the fact that we, as image bearers of a relational God, were made for relationship. And you think about any loving relationship, despite the beauty and the gift that is digital technology, the truth is, when I travel, I'm so grateful that I have FaceTime. Because I can call my wife and my kids and I can see their beautiful faces and talk and laugh and have these rich, robust conversations. But at the end of the day, the thing that it really makes me want to do is hop back on a plane and eventually fly home and hold my real kids in my real arms and give them real hugs. Yeah. And I think COVID revealed that need in us, not just for family or those closest to us, but that intrinsic body and bones need human beings have for embodied reality. I just remember in my neighborhood having so many sort of like shouting across the front yard conversations, <laughs> social distance, but still like, let's just stand in our front yard so we can at least physically see each other and talk, you know? And um, 
So, and that was true across the board, not just for older generations, but it was true for emerging generations. And uh, there's a reason why um, schools fought so hard to get kids back in the classroom uh, because we very quickly realized, oh, the learning experience is not just about the content. The content is critically important, of course, but it's really about the embodied experience of being in the same space with others and doing life in a sort of embodied way. Right. And you, you talk too about this sort of this versus that, a few things like um, I think slow down versus speed up. That's, you know, inherent in a digital world versus an analog world or like a digital relationship versus physical. Um, gathering as the world scatters and then commune versus critique. Um, those all three probably could be pulled apart further, but any one of those, wanted, if you wanted any of them jump out at you, kind of to this idea of embodiment, maybe like this commune versus critique. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think most people are familiar with the term outrage culture. We live in an outrage culture or cancel culture. Mm -hmm. The minute somebody doesn't say exactly what you like, the way you like it, they're canceled. You know what I mean? Like they're just, which I think is such a fascinating thought. You cannot cancel a human. Like that's not now you can do that on Twitter. Like you can cancel someone and push a few buttons and block them. You can petition to have Twitter delete their account or block their account, whatever, you know, you can't, but it's, that's not real. It's not. <laughs> and it's so fascinating because we, we live as if it's so utterly real, but it's not like that human person is still a human being that exists and lives and moves and breathes and has his or her being like in the world. Now, whether they're a good human or a bad human, that's a different conversation, but it just the concept of, of canceling a human, like doesn't actually conceptually make sense except in sort of a digital reality. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, in, in many ways, um, we are living as, as products of, uh, of a ruse. And that sounds really weird. What I'm not saying, I'm not downplaying the power of, um, you know, the, the powerful potential of digital interactions. Like what I'm not saying is if somebody says something totally inappropriate online, who cares? It's not real. That's not what I'm saying at all. There's, there's just, a, there is a lot of damage to be done with our words, you know, and our images and our, and our social media feeds. Absolutely. And I think Christians followers of Jesus need to be, uh, really, really, you know, mindful of that. But, um, ultimately at the end of the day, I, I, I just think, it becomes so easy to critique in the digital age. I mean, you think about, you read just some of the nasty threads that are online and you just, you imagine to yourself, there's no way. I mean, maybe not no way, but there's very minimal chance that this person would speak this way to this other person. If they were face to face sitting at a coffee shop, there's just no way. Mm. Um, and so there's a sort of like, you know, there's that phrase like drunken courage. People, people like, you know, drink liquid, too much alcohol. Liquid courage. Yeah. Liquid courage. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, um, I just, I think there's a, I think there's digital courage and it's really nasty mm. and, um, and it's really sad and really destructive. And so I think followers of Jesus are, um, one of the ways that we can cut through that digital noise is instead of critiquing, seek to commune. And I think what I mean by commune is like, it's, it's the difference between communicating and, you know, if communicating is exchanging information or data or words, communing would be one level deeper than that. It's the exchange of our presence. And I think Christians can do that in the digital age and offer a different path forward you know, where people are exchanging words like nasty words to each other online, we can step in as followers of Jesus and say, hey, instead of extending just more words, more vitriol to this online conversation or interaction, I want to I want to offer my presence. You know, can we meet for a cup of coffee if uh, the person's, you know, geographically nearby? Um can we engage on a more personal level instead of having this long, crazy, drawn out public 
discourse where we're just bashing each other. Can we talk, you know, can we FaceTime and just have an actual cordial conversation? So, you know, I think followers of Jesus have an opportunity um, uh, to, to show a, a better way forward, you know, mm-hmm. and, and a part of that is in a world of utter critique um, to seek to commune with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of my closing questions here. I'd like to get any book recommendations for from you before we go. But as a as a last question here, you talk about this idea um, of of trying stop seeking relevance, or maybe in this case, digital mm. relevance. Like try, like yeah. this, we ought to be relevant to culture. I mean, there's a relevant magazine you've written for, <laughs> um, and so talk to me about this idea of what we should offer the world instead of just relevance. Yeah. Transcendence. I think the world is hungry for transcendence. I actually think an unbelieving world is increasingly hungry for transcendence. I don't think that they're looking for the church to look sound and feel like everything else in their life. You know, um, I don't know how many people are familiar, but, um, a couple of years ago when Carl Lentz, who was a pastor at Hillsong uh, on the East Coast, um, had a very public fall from grace um, because of infidelity in his marriage. And um, I'm not critiquing Carl. I don't know him personally. And I pray that, you know, God's grace is abundant in his life and there's restoration and renewal for sure. But um, when he had his public fall from grace, for people who are unfamiliar, Carl Lentz was like this rising star in Western evangelicalism. He was a celebrity pastor, um, Justin Bieber, and uh, you know guys like yeah. Kevin Durant. He was like one of the greatest basketball players alive. These guys, these celebrities, A list celebrities, considered Carl Lentz their pastor. You know, and Carl would travel the world with these guys. And he, he looked the part. I mean, he's just like tall and handsome and wore really expensive Gucci shoes and just all of that, you know? (laughs) And then he has this incredible fall from grace. I share this because there was a, a, um, a journalist named Ben Sixsmith who wrote an article and Ben Sixsmith is not Christian. He's not a Christian, but he wrote an article, sort of a a commentary, like an op-ed, about Carl Lentz's fall from grace. And he's got this incredibly sobering line in the article. He basically says, essentially he says like, I'm not a Christian, but um, as a non-Christian, when I see a Christian and there's nothing about their life that seems any different than my life. In other words, what he's saying is if their life looks and feels and sounds just like my life, They're partying just like me. They're dressing just like me. They're pursuing cool and hip just like me and social media clout just like me. Ben Sixsmith, a non-Christian journalist, says, if their life looks just like my life, then it gives me pause because what it essentially tells me is there's nothing about Christianity that um, is attractive to me that I should aspire to. Mm -hmm. And instead, what it feels like is the Christian just wants to be like me. That's that's what Ben Sixsmith, a non-Christian journalist, wrote. And I think that gets to the heart of the matter. I think the most the most profound and effective way that followers of Jesus can reach an unbelieving world is not to look and sound like the unbelieving world, but instead to ask to invite an unbelieving world to consider the possibility of a life that just looks so dramatically different than the one they know. And uh, that's transcendence. That's the way of Jesus, you know? So uh, yeah, a lot more to say there, but there you go. Uh, Jay, you're quoting a lot of other people uh, as you speak, which I love. Um, We want to point people to your books and we'll do that in the show notes as well. Um, Analog Church, Analog Christian. But if there was another thinker, whether that's a great follow on Instagram, YouTube, or, you know, an actual real book, um, would there be one or two names that you'd want to throw out of um, if people want to dig more into this content? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, do you mean like specifically sort of digital analog divide sort of thing? Yeah, or? maybe. Well, I mean, you've thrown out so many names. I'm curious if there's like, oh, this is, if you're going to, if if you want to do a deeper dive into this, get my book, but also here's some people who've influenced my thinking or. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Along those lines and along these lines, our conversation here, uh, a few names come to mind. One would be Andy Crouch. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he wrote several years ago, he wrote a book called The TechWise um, Family. Uh, his most recent book, I think it's called The Life We Long For. Um, I've read it, but I don't recall the title, but it's an incredible book. So Andy Crouch, would be, he's got several other books from years past that are amazing. But Andy Crouch is um, someone who's been deeply influential to me and a good friend. He's become a great advocate for me. So Andy Crouch is someone who comes to mind. And then um, though he didn't write specifically about the digital age, somebody who has been really, really transformative and helpful for me and for tens of thousands of other Christians all over the world, hundreds of thousands um, would be uh, Dallas Willard, you know, and and a lot of my thinking about um, discipleship in the digital age is actually informed quite a bit about what Dallas wrote for many years about discipleship in general and what the life mm-hmm. of following Jesus actually looks like. So, so many others, you know, but those are a couple names that come to mind as far as Christian thinkers go, you know, um, Andy Crouch, Dallas Willard. And then outside of that, you know, people who are really interested in just sort of like the digital age and how to think critically about it. There's, you know, non-Christian thinkers who've been really influential for me, guys like um, Jerron Lanier, uh, Nicholas Carr, um, Sherry Turkle, who is a, she's a professor at MIT. And so, yeah, on and on there, there, there's lots been written and uh, it's all great stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Jay, thank you so much for your work, for your thinking, for this challenge. I think you've said some things here in this podcast we haven't heard in the ways you've said it. And so I um, mm. just appreciate your your insight. And because you are well-read, you come with just like a, an insight uh, into this issue that I just think is so timely and should be like a huge red warning sign to a lot of people that there are some things that are disordered in their life and in mm. their church that um, that we can change. Um, and that we can be uh, something that offers like a hopeful (laughs) light to the world. So thank you so much, Jay. Thank you so much for having me on. Jay, Kim, thank you for the conversation. I loved it. I love diving into your brain a little bit, and I hope others did too. Next week on the podcast, we have Brian Barcelona, and we're going to be talking about digital evangelism because he's reaching thousands of Gen Z on college campuses through a digital ministry that he leads. I think it's going to encourage you as you get your head around what this can look like in a practical way. If you're feeling like you're hearing a lot of bad news about church, this one is going to be good news for you. So thank you so much to our sponsors for making all of this possible to Compassion Canada, who are lifting children from poverty in Jesus' name, the new podcast, Scripture Untangled by the Canadian Bible Society, and Serve HQ, train your ministry volunteers, your leaders, and new members online, fast and easy with Serve HQ. Those links will always be down in the show notes. We don't want you to miss any of them. It means so much if you go and check out those links that help support this podcast. We would love if you would do it. The YouTube channel, if you haven't hit subscribe, if you're making Maybe listen to this podcast instead of watching the video. That's great. We love that you're listening. A lot of people prefer that way, but you're missing some stuff on the YouTube channel. We have a whole back catalog of not just the podcast, but we're coming out with fresh tutorials every week. And now we have a ton of tutorials on there already. We want to freely equip you, equip your team and how to communicate the best news in the world. It's complex. And so we want to break down some really practical topics for you about communication around websites, around branding and social media and all that kind of stuff. We're breaking it down on our YouTube tutorials. So check that out. Hit subscribe. It would mean a lot. Also, we'll see you day to day on that Digital Church Facebook group. Ask a question, share an article, share what you're excited about, what you're wrestling with. Would love to see you there and see you next week with Brian Barcelona on Wormy Digital Podcast.